friend Tanya Kuteva. I think she's probably known to all of you, but let me just give you some benchmarks. So Tanya is a professor at the University of Düsseldorf. She is a research associate in our department. And uh, so she is kind of part of our intellectual family. And she is a very renowned scholar of world leading standing, has written and co written really influential books on criticalization, language contact, um, English, and I probably forgot at least two or three of the topics here. I've worked on. Being very um, so, um, and today um, she has a very rebellious subject. <laughs> Um, so we're looking forward uh, to the talk on the mirrors of insubordination. Yeah. Okay, interesting that you should make this association with rebellious. Yeah, because <laughs> subordination is about subordinating, <laughs> uh, uh, subjecting. Uh, it's a little bit of a different context than, uh, of course, uh, the term is used here. Uh, in fact, I'm going to talk um, about a phenomenon uh, which, uh, as you see here in the title, is uh, referred to as the mirror of insubordination. So that will be in coordination, just to uh, make it easier. But before that, let me say that, as always, I'm very, very happy to, uh, to come back to, uh, to SAWAS. I know some of you, uh, and it's wonderful to, to, have, uh, um, to have you in my audience uh, today. Um, so as you, as you see already from the first slide, this is part of a, a bigger uh, project uh, co-authored by uh, Bert Heine and uh, uh, Peter Rostin as well, um, a PhD student of mine, uh, um, Domenico Nicolò, um, uh, um, uh, Marine uh, Villermé, and also uh, Sankhali um, from Hancock University, um, Seoul. Um, but now, let me very quickly walk you through the structure of this presentation. After a brief introduction, um, I'll be talking about uh, what actually we mean by this uh, term in coordination. Um, and we'll have to come uh, necessarily to uh, the uh, phenomenon of which in coordination we claim is a mirror, namely insubordination. Insubordination is a, a familiar by now term because it was introduced by uh, Nicholas Evans uh, back in uh, 2007, so I assume that you're all uh, familiar with it. And then um, I will come to the notion of mirativity. Why? Because in the following section, uh, I would uh, argue, I will argue that uh, in coordination um, can lead to uh, particular mirativity expressions. Mirativity in itself is a very interesting category because it too uh, is, uh, I mean, it is under researched in a sense and it became um, the uh, object of um, um, very um, um, active debate in the literature uh, like 10, 20 years ago, but still there are uh, a lot of linguists uh, who uh, just um, come into question its very existence. So in itself, mirativity is an interesting category, and of course, uh, if it is possible for us to combine the two notions of mirativity and incoordination, uh, we, we decided to just grab the chance and do that. Uh, and it also um, um, uh, suits our purposes very well. Um, then, um, I, uh, then I will um, uh, try and give you a bird's eye uh, picture, the global picture, um, within which uh, it is possible to place the bo both notions in subordination, in coordination, and uh, in fact, we'll be talking about uh, in co-subordination. Why? Because, as is well known, these two uh, phenomena, coordination and subordination, are not uh, exactly uh, two clear-cut, discrete uh, phenomena. Rather, there is 
gradients uh, between them. So it has been uh, pointed out in the literature already that in some languages we can uh, we find structures which are neither examples of coordination nor of subordination, but rather co-subordination. And then, of course, it makes sense for us to ask the question: uh, Is it also possible to talk of <coughs> in co-subordination, just like we can talk uh, of? in subordination and in coordination uh, as well. Uh, and we will answer uh, tentatively this question in the positive, and then we'll come to the conclusions. Um, so let's um, start from the beginning, and let me tell you uh, in the introduction that my, uh, I mean, our major goals here are to build a case for the existence of a cross-linguistically identifiable morphosyntactic phenomenon, which we propose to call in coordination. Uh, and also to show that incoordination mirrors a phenomenon that has been described as um, insubordination by um, Evans 2007. And then there is a recent uh, volume also um, with a lot of articles on uh, insubordination. So for this purpose, um, we will uh, examine uh, the category um, uh, of mirativity, as, as I pointed out. Well, mirativity, more generally speaking, has to do with uh, that particular emotion of all basic emotions, which is considered to be the, the hardest one to fake. Right Here uh, you have uh, several pictures um, of uh, surprise, um, I mean, of how surprise is expressed. Uh, in body language. Um, but now, of course, here we're interested in uh, mirativity, the expression of surprise uh, by uh, linguistic means. So now, this was a very small introduction. Let me come to the uh, second section, namely in coordination. What is actually uh, in coordination? This is our object of investigation, as I pointed out. Um, so this is a process uh, with a starting point a complex coordinated uh, sentence um, with coordinating connectives such as but and we know that um, you know the, the, the canonical uh, 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 conjunctions uh, which are pointed out as coordinating conjunctions are but and and or he will be talking about but and 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 I'll come to the point also of, um, of you know how or uh, figures in uh, in our discussion here actually we, we we've only been able to um, identify or as relevant to, to our topic in one uh, in a single language so uh, it will have to be put aside for the time being um, now uh, when we have so Let's come back to the starting point, namely a coordinated uh, complex um, uh, sentence with a co coordinated connectives such as but and and. Um, now, it has been pointed out that the relationship between the conjuncts, these are the two clauses of the complex coordinated sentence, um, the relationship between the conjuncts, between the two clauses, can be either symmetric or asymmetric. So the first examples here uh, illustrate a symmetric relationship between the conjuncts. Um, this is uh, where, I mean, these are uh, cases where the conjuncts can be um, um, changed freely, so they're interchangeable. For instance, Fords can go fast and Oldsmobiles are safe. This is a so-called symmetric uh, and. Um, an example of um, another symmetric um, um, relationship with the conjunction but would be faults can go fast but Oldsmobiles are safe. Um, here we have a semantic opposition but. Again, clearly you can um, uh, change the places of the uh, conjuncts um, without any difference in meaning. Now when it comes to asymmetric relationship between the conjuncts, uh, we have um, uh, situa a situation where the conjuncts are in chronological or causal relationship. Um, an example of, uh, of an asymmetric and will be, Fords can go fast and Harry just got a ticket for speeding. Uh, an example of an asymmetric uh, but would be, Fords can go fast but Harry will never get a ticket for speeding. 
Um, now, our concern in this study is with asymmetric relationship between conjuncts. Um, so, in this situation, you have your first conjunct uh, being the dominating clause, and the second conjunct, the dominated clause. Force can go fast is the dominating clause in, in this particular example, and the dominated one is. Uh, Harry just got a ticket for speeding, and the uh, connective between them is the coordinator and. Um, now, so what happens actually in, uh, in coordination? Uh, we have the starting point, namely the, the two conjuncts uh, of the uh, complex coordinated sentence. There is the uh, coordinator between them. Um, and this is what you see in A here, right? So the, the clause one, um, it is, of course, in the case of coordinated sentences, the main clause. Um, you have the coordinate connective in clause two, the other main clause. Um, an example would be John is tall, but he's not good at basketball. Um, so this is a starting point, and then the transition from this starting point to, uh, to, to, to a structure like in B, where you only have the coordinating connective um, followed by the second clause, which again is a main clause because we're dealing with complex coordinated structures. Now, that would be what we call in coordination. So the first clause gets omitted and what is used is only the coordinated connective and the second clause. An example of this uh, would be in number two. So let me read this aloud. Um, what was there before it began? Where did it, all, where did it all come from? And how does it all work and why? This is physics, George. Exciting, brilliant and fascinating physics. But that is really Okay, oh, the right intonation. But that is really interesting. Hannah, <laughs> oh, maybe you can do that. <laughs> um, anyway, what is important here is, of course, that we see. But the coordinating con uh, connective is at the beginning of the of the uh, um, um, uh, 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 of the utterance, um, uh, 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 and then we have uh, clause two, um, and. Uh, and this is perfectly fine, there is no communicative breakdown or anything um, because uh, all the information that the hearer needs is there, it is in the context itself. Um, so def the definition of incoordination that we propose is that this is a mechanism underlying the use of the sequence coordinating connective plus clause 2 in contexts where clause 1 is missing but it is pragmatically inferred. So what happens in coordination is, uh, I mean, coordination, this process involves coordinating connectives, such as but and and, and I will give you examples of this in different languages. Um, then uh, we see that in, coordi I mean, in coordination is what I'm talking about. In coordination leads to the sentence initial use of coordinating connectives, as we saw in the example, and um, this process results in the independent use of formally coordinated clauses. So then, of course, uh, there arises the legitimate question, uh, do the coordinating connectives change their status after they undergo uh, incoordination? Well, in the starting point, the complex coordinated sentence, we speak of uh, coordinators, we speak of conjunctions, coordinating conjunctions, but then if you have, uh, I mean, your process of in, in coordination and, and the resulting um, uh, new structure with a, a particular uh, form uh, of the initially, uh, of the erstwhile uh, coordinated conjunction and the second clause only, isn't this something different? Um, we argue that incoordination leads to change in the status of the coordinated connective. So, from a connective, you uh, come to a, to a sentence particle. Um, now, the, the connective but, um, when it is used in a complex coordinated sentence, links two segments on the basis of contrast or denial of expectation. Um, for instance, faults can go fast, 
but Harry will never get a ticket for speeding. This is a sentence that we um, discussed already. Um, however, when, uh, I mean, after in coordination, uh, this but um, becomes a sentence a particle because but expresses now the speaker's attitude and it doesn't link segments. It may but doesn't have to even relate to a linguistic chunk. Uh, that is, it is not bound to a previous assertion by an interlocutor. Uh, in fact, you can just open a conversation, you can start, um, you know, your utterance um, and, and, and you can use but in the beginning. So you could say, uh, oh, but that's a beautiful landscape and this could be something um, uttered by a speaker who admires the surrounding landscape while travelling by train or you can also imagine somebody talking to himself or, um, or herself or thirds. <coughs> Um, so, um, this is what we propose to, to uh, term in coordination. And um, in coordination has been under the radar of uh, scholarly uh, research. Nicholas Evans predicted, in fact, its existence, but he postponed its study for a further stage of research, and I'm quoting here <coughs> what <coughs> uh, uh, Evans says uh, on this. Uh, in his article on insubordination. He explicitly says, I shall exclude from this survey, for reasons of scope, formally coordinated clauses used independently. Um, but uh, uh, in, in this uh, study, uh, Nick uh, established um, the phenomenon of insubordination across languages. So let's take a closer look now at uh, insubordination because we're constantly comparing the two processes here. Um, the way uh, insubordination was defined <coughs> was that this is a phenomenon whereby the subordinated clause of a, subord uh, of a complex subordinate sentence comes to be used as a standalone independent main clause. So um, the, I'm quoting here um, Evans's uh, definition of insubordination. <coughs> Was uh, of an insubordinated clause was the conventionalized main clause use of what on prima facie grounds appear to be formally subordinate clauses. <coughs> and here we have some examples uh, of insubordination. Um, if you could lend me your pen, please. So we see it's only the subordinated mm -hmm. clause. Uh, I mean, the structure is, is one of a subordinate, subordinate clause, but it is used independently. And uh, there is absolutely no problem in uh, inferring the meaning here. Plausibly, this is derived from, I'd be most grateful if you could lend me your pen, please. Another example uh, is that you would come to my party. Mm -hmm. Plausibly derived from, I never expected that you would come to my party. Um, and of course, language users have no difficulty in supplying from the discourse pragmatic context. Um, the plausible contents of the missing main clause. So, what is initially a subordinate clause may be used as an independent main clause on its own. This is what insubordination is. And insubordination can be observed not only in English. Um, here we have um, the so called um, uh, less clause construction. Um, this is from uh, uh, Peter Austin's um, uh, grammar of diary. Um, uh, where uh, uh, we observe, um, you know, uh, the process of insubordination. What is uh, initially a less uh, clause, uh, namely a complex less clause construction, a complex subordinated sentence, <coughs> uh, becomes uh, uh, what has been ter termed uh, apprehensive use of only the main clause. Um, so the less the less clause <coughs> called also precautioning or volative of fear, in other words, uh, encode, <coughs> these clauses encode an, a, an apprehension causing situation, which is an undesirable feared situation, um, and they're subordinated to a main clause or precautionary situation clause, which indicates um, a possibility to avert it or the avoidance situation clause. Um, so that would be, um, an example of a less uh, uh, clause, um, uh, I mean the, the complex uh, uh, clause construction, be quiet 
or uh, HITU. Here we have the precautionary situation encoded in the first clause, uh, and then you have the apprehension causing situation um, encoded in the, uh, in the second clause, and as you can see, there is this suffix, uh, the lest um, uh, form, uh, the suffix is yati, and uh, uh, in English uh, this is translated by uh, lest. Um, lest itself is the, uh, the result of a grammaticalization development in English. Now, um, this is the starting point, the less clause construction, but then um, uh, you can uh, have the uh, first clause, the precautionary situation clause, submitted, uh, so the result is, uh, is an apprehensive. Uh, and if you want to say, this dog might bite you, uh, you just use the less clause on its own, and um, um, the way that uh, uh, Peter Austin um, 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 discusses this is that yati appears to function as a main clause, as a main clause verb suffix. Nevertheless, it is clear from the context that an understood imperative, warning, or suggestion is implicit. Um, now. Another example of insubordination um, uh, are purposive clauses that can be used alone. This particular, these particular examples here have not been uh, discussed uh, in the literature. That's why uh, we pay special attention to them. Um, for instance, in English, uh, you, can, you can have to have with a main clause. Right. Obviously, this is also an erstwhile uh, subordinated uh, clause, but it can be used uh, on its own. And thanks to the context, um, here, uh, obviously, it is, I mean, it is plausibly derivable from I have brought this wine, for example, to have with the main cause. Another example would be to read on the journey. The context is picking up a book on display at a railway station. Plausibly derivable from this would be a good book to buy to read on the journey. Um, we have examples from German, zum Trinken, by Hauptgericht. Um, you have exactly the same situation, to drink at the main course, to have with the main course. Very similar. You have an example from Italian here, also from French, um, uh, likewise. I mean, things uh, are the same there. Um, um, this is uh, a bit more. Now, uh, why do we say that? Uh, this was about insubordination, right? And uh, as the title of uh, this talk is the, uh, the Mirror of Insubordination, why do we say that incoordination um, is a mirror of insubordination? Well, obviously this is a metaphor, uh, hopefully it captures the, uh, the parallels here. Um, just to make this um, um, graphically representable, um, let's take a look at um, what you have in one and two uh, in the first um, couple of sen uh, in the first in these first lines here, and uh, which capture the mm -hmm. uh, the the nature of uh, insubordination. So, what do we have in in insubordination? We have clause one, then we have the subordinated connective. And we have clause two, um, and uh, that's the initial, that's the starting uh, point in, in uh, subordination. But then after insubordination, uh, we just have uh, only the subordinated connective um, and clause two. For example, if you would give me the, pe the pen, please, if you remember, right? Um, so. The first clause is omitted, only the connective, the subordinated connective is used, and the, the second clause. And very similarly, like in a mirror fashion almost, um, in incoordination, uh, we have again as a starting point a complex um, a sentence structure with clause one and, and clause two, um, connected by a connective, only this time it is a coordinating one. Uh, and uh, the, the result of the process of incoordination is something very um, similar, um, maybe omitted first clause. What remains is the connective, it is this time coordinated connective, uh, and the second clause. Um, so we will, um, okay, I mean, this is the reason why we, we call uh, uh, incoordination the mirror of insubordination. 
Um, there are different. There are differences, of course, simply because in the one case we're dealing with uh, subordination, with the other one with uh, coordination, and the connectives are of, diff of a different nature. Now we pass on to the next section, um, which is about mirativity, because we would like to illustrate in more detail the phenomenon of incoordination by taking a closer look at uh, this uh, category and the way that it is encoded. Um, across languages. Um, so we will claim that incoordination can lead to the rise of model sentence particles which express mirativity, among other things. Um, mirativity um, uh, was, um, uh, so to say, I mean, it, it was um, put on the map. Um, by uh, Delancey, 1997, 1997 uh, 2001, uh, th there are also some later works of his. Uh, I mean, uh, Delancey, Scott Delancey, uh, um, uh, insisted that uh, this is a category in its own right. Uh, right. He defined it um, as conveying information, as a category conveying information which is new or unexpected to the speaker. In the literature so far, uh, there's been there has been a broad range of mirativity that there has been um, 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 proposed a broad range of mirativity values with respect to the speaker, the audience or the accuracy, or thirds, the main character in a narrative. Um, so the, um, the major elements, of the major notions uh, relevant uh, to the category of narrativity are sudden discovery, surprise, unprepared mind, counter-expectation, new information. As you can see, all of these are related somehow. Uh, we take the, the notion of surprise, the value of surprise, to be the core one um, for a number of reasons. Um, now, not every meaning within the mirative range is expressed in every language. The most consistent one uh, is uh, to A, that is surprise of the speaker, and 3A, unprepared mind of the speaker. This could be considered the core meaning of the mirative label. This is a quote from uh, Eichenwald, um, 2012. Us, our standpoint is that surprise is the core meaning of mirativity since um, it typically entails the other meanings uh, with the exception of new information. Um, notice that uh, this does not always have to be the case. Uh, for example, uh, Christa Koenig uh, in a forthcoming work um, shows that uh, one of the Khoisan languages, and excuse me, I cannot, I cannot <laughs> do the, uh, the click sound here. Uh, there are people who, who can do that better than me. Uh, but in this language we have a surprise mirative marker uh, which is in complementary distribution with a distinct counter expectation marker. So one has to be, uh, you know, always careful, but we're talking about a, a tendency. Now, uh, let me just um, uh, exemplify the category of mirativity by means of a language, by means of a Tibeto Burman language spoken in Nepal. This is an example that Eichenwald herself gives. So here, the English translation is. Father shot the leopard. I realized to my surprise is the, the implication. Uh, now, father shot, shot the leopard. Um, so what you have uh, is it, it, the glosses are father in the ergative, leopard, the dative case, uh, should nominalizer, and then you have this um, imperfective mirative specialized dedicated form for the mirative category uh, name. Um, now, we have to um, uh, we have to, to make a distinction here between mirativity versus uh, evidentiality. These two have uh, traditionally been discussed together uh, in the literature, uh, and um, so let's um, uh, tease those apart. Mirativity, uh, as I said, gained popularity, has gained popularity since 1997, um, but it is still a debated topic in the literature, for example, one of our colleagues here from the Sawas um, 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 uh, in 
killed 20, uh, 2012, and also in, in other words, um, calls its existence uh, into question, and uh, there has been a, a really a very lively uh, debate about uh, about this. Um, I think that it is understandable why um, um, mirativity is uh, an elusive uh, category, um, because it is really frequently expressed by uh, evidential markers um, uh, in many languages. And in fact, up to 1997, it was not um, systematically distinguished from the category of um, evidentiality. So this is why it is important to um, uh, take a look at the, dis the, the difference between meritivity and, and uh, evidentiality. Our standpoint here is that meritivity is not the same as evidentiality and my own, my mother tongue here um, uh, comes very helpful because uh, I'm a speaker of a language where we do have um, 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 evidentiality uh, as a very well established grammatical category and um, there's also a lot of uh, research done on that also in Bulgarian um, and um, it is clear that mirativity I mean on, Bulgar on the basis of Bulgarian data alone that mirativity and evidentiality constitute two different categories um, not only because of the semantics of the context in which they are used but also because there is a particular uh, formal difference between them in one particular context which has to do with third person singular, uh, third person um, plural and single, singular. But first of all, what does actually mirativity mean? Uh, uh, sorry, not mirativity, <laughs> evidentiality. We're talking about the, the connection between, the distinction between mirativity and evidentiality. Evidentiality is a grammatical categ uh, category. Uh, it is grammatical marking of the source of information. So it is about the source of information. Different languages with evidenti ev evidentiality markers um, um, sophisticated, so to say, to a different degree when it comes to uh, the expression of the uh, source of information. Uh, in some languages, you only have, you know, two distinctions within the evidentiality category: something which is witnessed by the speaker and something which is hearsay. In other languages, you could have, uh, you know, up to seven, as far as I remember, depending on whether it is visual information, audible information, infant information, etc., etc. Languages differ in that respect. But here are here are examples from from Bulgarian. Uh, and I'm so proud. This is one of the languages where I can pronounce something and I can feel really my element. <laughs> and not, uh, okay, so Timotius de Pluvis is uh, uh, what you would have, you know, in the, um, in the normal uh, situation where uh, the speaker is also the witness. It means you can swim. Uh, I can see it or I know it firsthand. Um, so, um, and in the second example, uh, you have uh, the evidential category marked Tisimoshi with the pluvish. Uh, it means they say, reportedly, you can swim. So you see, th there is a difference between the witness and non-witness in the, in the uh, non-witness, that is the hearsay, mm -hmm. um, the, ev the evidentiality uh, marker um, is, uh, well, it, it is in fact an auxiliary construction. You have the, um, you have the, um, the, the verb to be conjugated for a person number in tens, um, and you also have one particular uh, form of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the verb, which is called an aorist uh, uh, participle, um, ending in L. Um, so that's a different uh, um, formal expression of the of the evidential, a dedicated one uh, to, uh, you know, to this particular category. Um, now, in Bulgarian, the evidential can be used as one of the strategies to express meritivity. So you can say, I'm it means I'm surprised you can swim. And this is the case in other languages as well. Hence, the temptation to collapse the two categories into one. This may well have been the reason why narrativity has turned out to be such an evasive category. Because, of course, you have uh, one in the same form, which can have the two functions. It's very tempting to say, well, um, it's just one of the same thing. Um, however, um, um, 
there exists a clear indication that we are dealing with two different categories, I'm talking still about Bulgarian here, evidential and mirative in Bulgarian. The two differ in their formal expression in one particular type of context, namely when the third person is involved. In most cases, the auxiliary verb to be is omitted from the grammaticalized expression of the mirative but not of the evidential. That's for Bulgarian. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some languages you have even better, even more straightforward evidence that mirativity and evidentiality are two different things, can be two different things, also can be diff totally differently expressed. So in some languages there are distinct expressions for the mirative and the evidential altogether. And these can co-occur within the same sentence. Um, here's an example from um, Eichenwald, um, uh, the English translation is, I realize to my surprise that apparently I have eaten this type of meat. Uh, obviously there was something wrong with that meat, uh, and when the speaker realized that, you know, she produced that, um, the utterance, and here um, you see in the final uh, form um, uh, 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 of the verb, um, we have these two uh, um, uh, 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 I mean, forms, the le, which is imperfective, mirative, and sa, which is inferential, um, uh, that marked for the first uh, person, um, first person uh, pronoun. Um, so, different um, uh, formal expression. Um, now, that was one thing. Yeah. One important thing, evidentiality and mirativity are distinct, they're different things. Another important thing that we have to point out here is that there is a distinction also that we make between, uh, also in this uh, uh, study, that we make between mirativity and the mirative, all right? So, mirativity is a term used for uh, a semantic category. Right? And mirative is a grammatical category. This is the meaning of, of mirativity expressed by a dedicated grammatical, grammaticalized uh, structure. So our concern here is mirativity as a semantic category and the scope of its formal expression across languages. Now, it has been um, uh, um, pointed out already in the literature that mirativity can be expressed by means of, first of all, of course, prosody. You can, you know, with the right prosody, with the right intonation, <laughs> you can do, you can put everything into a mirative um, context. Um, she came to my lecture, you know, this is just an, a normal uh, utterance, uh, nothing mirative, uh, everything as expected. Uh, she came to my lecture. You do the right prosody and there is the expression of surprise. So prosody is very helpful. Uh, I mean, it always helps to express mirativity. Now, we also have exclamatives with WH words, words to infinitives, that complementizes. And these are examples uh, that we've taken from uh, Evans 2007. As you can see, all of them are actually cases of insubordination. Why they don't schedule the under 11s? Oh, this is fir this first. This is not W, but it's F, right? First, why they why why they don't schedule the under 11 11s first, yeah. right? Um, to think that she should be so ruthless. That's another uh, exclamative uh, construction. That I would meet you here. Again, my my, uh, my intonation might not be the the, the right one, but uh, I mean with these examples. Uh, mirativity being expressed here. We also have lexical and formulaic expression. Of course, I mean, you can just say, I'm surprised, I'm amazed, I'm shocked, oh my god, lo and behold, this, this is used uh, in, in narratives, for example. Um, uh, well, I'm told by my uh, Chinese informants that um, in Chinese, if you want to say I'm surprised, you use a lot of, they don't have a dedicated grammatical uh, morpheme for that, so they have a number of expressions and they are all expletives, but really very, very graphic expletives. <laughs> I don't have them here, but I mean many, many languages, <laughs> well, I mean, um, many languages uh, have a lot of those. Yeah, but also, <laughs> um, so, um, 
there is um, special linguistic expressions dedicated to encoding mirativity as a grammatical morpheme, independent of evidentials or tense aspect. Namely, we have the mirative really as a grammatical morpheme, right? Um, the one that uh, actually we exemplified a, a couple of sites um, uh, ago from Amaga. Um, and um, there is also uh, a, 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 um, one, two, three, four, five, a fifth group of expressions of the mirativity category, namely a non-dedicated grammatical means of expressing mirativity. Um, uh, Alexandra Eichenwald co uh, calls these mirative strategies. So you have particular grammatical means which have particular functions and as an additional function they can also be used to express mirativity. And it is this group of, uh, lex uh, of linguistic expressions uh, that we that we are mainly concerned with, and this is what I'm going to talk about uh, now, because um, um, uh, the focus of, of, of this study is actually um, that uh, there exists a... Okay, let, let me first uh, say what the, the status quo is regarding uh, this uh, group of non-dedicated grammatical means of expressing mirativity or mirative strategies. In the specialized literature so far, um, there have been pointed out three groups of expressions um, as mirativity strategies, as mirative strategies, namely verbal categories, um, evidentials, person marking. And um, uh, our proposal here is that uh, there exists um, an additional group of expressions, namely coordinated connectives such as but and and, which after they go, after they undergo incoordination, become sentence particles for expressing, uh, uh, and the whole construction then becomes um, a mirativity expression. So this is the fourth group and um, we want to add this uh, to, to what has been done already in, uh, I mean, in, in, in research on mirativity. So, but let me first um, uh, um, um, illustrate to you, uh, you know, what has been pointed out in the literature, verbal categories. How can a verbal category, for instance, the aorist, the aorist, which is a verb formally, uh, sorry, which is a verb form typically used as a narrative past in Hindi and Urdu, uh, this may express surprise of the speaker as an additional mirative function. So in a context uh, where a couple and their 15-year-old son visit their old friend after a long time, and the friend can hardly recognize the boy um, whom he had known as a child, um, this is a sentence uh, which uh, has been uh, um, an utterance that has been made, um, and <clears throat> I can but cite it. Um, so my, how tall has he be How tall he has become? What you're saying um, is, hey, how much tall be? And then you have go or become, uh, and the marker. Yeah, yeah, was go, uh, and the marker is ya. Yeah. Uh, the marker for the aorist uh, here is used not as an aorist, like normally it is just a, a, a narrative past, right? Narrative bounded past, but as a marker of mirativity. So the speaker is confronted with an unexpected factor situation, here the size of the boy, and uses the aorist rather than the perfect or present which would only mean a neutral statement. The use of the same form in the aorist would have a different meaning in a narrative. He became very tall, right? So you see how something which is designed with one particular function, namely past, bounded, can also acquire an additional function, namely mirativity. Another uh, well-recognized uh, way to encode um, uh, the mirative as a mirative strategy is, as I pointed out already, evidential. Uh, well, here is another example, again from Bulgarian. 
The non-first-hand information evidential or reported speech marker can be used to express speaker's surprise. For example, if I were to say, I have, well, I have money, it means have, the first person singular present, and then money. But then, if I use uh, the form of the evidential, which is hearsay, something you know, like, like reported speech, non-witnessed, uh, which doesn't make sense because it's me, right? I'm talking about me. Uh, nevertheless, I can use this form of the evidential hearsay, and I can say, which means, uh, uh, I'm surprised, my God, I thought that I don't have any money, but thank God, I could go to the restaurant, I can treat myself with a nice meal, I have money. I'm so nice and surprised. So the speaker suddenly discovers that she has money which she did not think she had. Um, so, evidentials are very often used uh, to express narrativity. And then there are some languages where there is a special person marking depending on whether uh, it is a narrative um, expression or not. So, in Tzafiki, spoken in uh, Ecuador, uh, there is alternation between conjunct and disjunct person marking, um, which marks new information and surprise, especially in first person contexts. The disjunct person marking indicates something out of the speaker's control, unexpected and thus surprising. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, now, the present proposal is, as I said, that there exists, in addition to these three groups of expressions, also a fourth group of non-dedicated grammatical expressions of narrativity, namely sentence particles, which result from the incoordination of coordinated connectives, such as but and and. Um, so we come now to uh, the way that incoordination and narrativity uh, uh, fit together. Um, the first example, the, the, the first coordinating conjunction that uh, we will consider is but, and we will see how the process of incoordination, where but is involved, can lead to the expression of narrativity. Um, so, here is the, uh, the, the representation of incoordination again, the transition from a complex coordinated sentence with a Clause one, main clause, uh, clause two, also main clause, coordinating connective, and then to a situation where you only have the coordinating connective and the second clause, this is in coordination. And here is an example of in coordination. So this example results um, in the expression of narrativity. It, is, it, it, it expresses surprise and it is the result of the process of incoordination. Um, many citizens of the so-called first world are still shocked to discover that, that we tropical islanders, islanders speak English. But you speak English so well, they say. Right? So you see, but is used in the beginning. Um, of, the, of the sentence and it's followed by the second clause and um, this is exactly the structure that we have as a result of incoordination. Well, here we have, um, uh, we have contacted our colleagues uh, who work uh, uh, you know, in, in the area of narrativity and it is interesting um, to see that the recover, recoverability of the missing clause in the incoordination of but is a matter of gradients which depends on single languages and possibly on single speakers because um, for instance Alexander Eichenwald and Viktor Friedman, Viktor Friedman is a Slavist, Slavist he, he's done extensive work on Bulgarian, a language with evidentiality as I uh, pointed out, um, their uh, opinion uh, about the recoverability of the missing clause is very different from the opinion of Scott Delancey, for example. So let me let me um, read those. Um, the less speakers feel the need to reconstruct the missing clause or are able to do so at all, the less the component of contrast or opposition or denial of expectation is anchored in their mental representation and the more the narrative is entrenched. Hence, 
the contrasting judgments of language users, for instance, Alexandra Akinwald, Victor Friedman, uh, uh, Friedman uh, Scott, versus Scott Delassi. Alexandra Akinwald and Victor Friedman view but as mirative both in dialogical contexts, that is to say when you have, you know, person A says something, person B says something, but also um, in um, when it bears no trace of objection to the previous student by the interlocutor, uh, but only constitutes an approving emotional response to the content of the latter, and in monological context where you can start, you can open a conversation um, with a big, with but, for instance, uh, where narrative but is already implied by the omitted sentence involving counter expectation. Both admit, however, that they have no adequate explanation for this phenomenon. For Scott de Lancy, um, I mean, he still strongly perceives the component of objection or contrast, um, contra contrast in dialogical context. I don't think, I mean, this is Scott de Lancy cited. Uh, about it. I don't think that this construction is mirative, although my intuition is that it, uh, that it always occurs with mirative intonation. It's hard to explicate the force of but in examples like that, but it seems to have to do with emotional shading. For me, this construction can only be used with a clause expressing emotional evaluation. But that's awful, terrible, terrific. It seems to me that the sense of the construction you're talking about is originally contra contrastive. It occurs only in response to a statement and seems to imply something like, that's terrible, even though you didn't say so. It's very interesting. Also, when I speak, for instance, with um, uh, 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 speakers of Mandarin Chinese as, as their first language, uh, there is a very clear understanding that they can start an utterance with but in a mirative sense only if somebody else has said something. But you can never start, for example, but that's a wonderful landscape on your own, you know? Or you s imagine you see a very unpleasant situation. Uh, you see somebody like five meters away from you who is stealing your, your bike. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that, that somebody, you know, well, let's say not, not five, but 50 meters away from you, <laughs> that somebody cannot hear you. And you, you, your first reaction is, but, that, but that's my bike. You're surprised, right? You can say but perfectly well. I think you can say that in German, can't you? No, no, in German it's a different story because you have your, your aber in the middle of the sentence. So we'll, we'll come to German a little bit later. You, you, can, you can just start, uh, you know, you can open it. But, well, you can, you can make your utterance uh, say, but that's my bike. You can never do that in Mandarin Chinese. I think here we're dealing with, with a very similar situ uh, situation, also depending, not only on the language, but depending also on individual speakers. For some of them, it depends really whether it is a dialogical or monological context. And that's a very fine distinction, a very interesting one too. Now, in coordination and mirativity, uh, and uh, we saw that um, in English, for instance, it is possible to, uh, to, to see how incoordination can lead to, um, to mirativity, I mean, to, to, an to an expression of uh, uh, surprise. Uh, but English is not the only language. This is another uh, uh, language um, um, uh, from, uh, uh, I mean, manga, manga Rai. Um, uh, where you see that the conjunction but can also function as a sentence particle it can, and, it, it, and it is then an expression of mirativity. So in the first sentence here you have this side is not sacred but that side is sacred. So this side, then you have um, non-sacred, then you have the conjunction but in the second conjunct, the second clause is other side, sacred. But you can also have uh, the, um, uh, the sentence gana yi, which means but fat. And it means, oh, it is fat. So you see how in this language we have, uh, again, um, uh, a but uh, 
used in the beginning is a sentence particle and then there follows the second clause. Um, Bulgarian, you can use but. Um, in fact, we have uh, three words for but in Bulgarian. One of them is very colloquial, ama. It comes from Persian, sorry, it comes from Arabic through Persian, through Turkish, and then into Bulgarian. Uh, it's ama. Uh, the, the, another but is no, which is very neutral. Uh, we have another one, but it is not relevant. And the first two buts, ama and no, both of them can undergo, can undergo in coordination and become um, expression, expressions of immunitivity. So, um, in the example, Tiao bujava dica, ama ili no ni iska da si ima svoj sobstveni. She adores children but doesn't want to have children of her own. This is uh, the example where we see but in its normal adversative function. Uh, but you can also have this uh, in a context where here it comes out of the swimming pool and speaker opens the conversation and the speaker knows from the hearer already from an earlier conversation from an earlier communication that the hearer i mean the hearer said to the speaker that the hearer cannot swim uh, but then um, you know the situation is such that obviously the <laughs> that hearer can swim so this is what the speaker says and opens the conversation Meaning, I'm surprised that you can swim. Plausibly derivable from I expected you uh, to not being able to swim, but contrary to expectation, you, you can swim, right? So, Bulgarian is another language where uh, a but uh, can be a, a but form can be used. Uh, I mean, a but conjunction becomes a sentence particle for the expression of imperativity. Mm -hmm. We have examples from Serbo-Croatian and Bosnian. Same thing. We have an example from Italian where you can see that ma, which means ba, it can also be used. I'm surprised that this, that this car is fast, but this car is fast. This is what you're saying, literally, um, in Italian, also for the expression of. Um, same thing in Dutch. Um, um, if you want to say, you hear, look who we have here. Uh, what you say is you use ma, which is but, but who we there have. So again, the uh, in French, this is um, the cover of a, a nice a children's uh, book. Uh, and as you can see, there is the mummy bunny and the, the, the small rabbit. And uh, the mummy is very happy that uh, the, the, the small rabbit, the, the, the bunny can finally walk. She's nicely surprised. Uh, and uh, she says, but you're walking, and the way that she says that is by using me in French in the beginning of her utterance. So again, uh, we have um, the use of uh, the conjunction but as a sentence particle uh, for the expression of narrativity. German is a very special situation. Why? Well, because well, if we take aber, can also be used in the beginning of a sentence. However, if you use it, aber is but in German. If you use it in the beginning of, uh, uh, of your utterance, you have to use doch. And doch is a very special monoparticle particle in German. And actually, doch is the one. It is the monoparticle particle which expresses merativity. Aber in itself is a bit different here. So if I want to say, I'm surprised that this is Dieter, you would say, aber das ist doch Dieter. Mm -hmm. So doch is very important. Uh, if you want to do your uh, merativity, if you want to express it only by means of but, then interestingly, you have to put but not at the beginning but in the middle, after the verb. Dieses Auto ist aber schnell. This is what you have to say. And it's a very interesting question, why? Um, I mean, like, we've been, we've been thinking about that. Uh, we have a couple of suggestions, but maybe in the discussion period we'll, we'll come to that. Um, now, another language where you can do uh, the same thing. You can use your conjunction, but as a sentence particle to express merativity and put it in the beginning, um, is Turkish. Um, you see, ama, the same, the same one, the, the same form which comes from uh, Arabic, through Persian, through Turkish, to Bulgarian. You can use ama if you want to say, but you can swim in a, in a similar context. Um, and not only in Turkish, you have this in Lebanese, Arabic, uh, 
um, BES is uh, used there uh, and it, it can be used optionally. But this is not the case in all languages. Um, in Mandarin Chinese, um, for instance, they have three different words for but, right? As a conjunction, as a link, as a connective. Um, but in Mandarin Chinese, uh, if you want to say, I'm surprised you're still here, um, then you have very special, uh, I mean, you have specialized adverbials, which means, which mean surprise, to be surprised, right? So you would say you, and then this particular adverbial, not, the conjunc not any of the conjunctions, but still be here, right? I'm surprised you're still here. Um, Persian, you cannot use but in order to, um, um, you know, to express surprise. Um, so, let us say the, the same situation. You come out of the, of, of the room and you see your student who wanted you to help him. <laughs> you, 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 you told him, no, we have to come tomorrow because I have to go to a meeting afterwards. But the student is, I mean, he needs your help. He's still waiting uh, there for you. And you come out of the room and you say, you're still here, right, in a normal way. But, but if you're surprised, and if you want to express that you're surprised, in Persian, you would say, you, and then you would use K, which is a complementizer. That, still, here, then, be. Uh, means that you should still be here, Basically, you see, just like in English, we have insubordination here, but not in coordination of uh, but. So, um, it is not the case that but can always be used as an um, um, expression for memorativity. Now, we also have some examples of um, the coordinating conjunction and uh, uh, where we see that uh, they, uh, this conjunction can also undergo uh, in coordination. Um, uh, so when used sentence initially, the coordinating conjunction may come to express that speaker utters surprise after receiving new information. Um, in the first example, Mary cleaned the room and went to the movies. We have uh, a sequential uh, meaning um, and, I mean, it means sequence. Uh, in the second example, that's what she said, that's what she told me, and I believed her. Um, here, there is ambiguity, you know, about the meaning of and. It, and. it could be sequential, it could also be mirative. In the third example, um, obviously, it is only a mirative um, um, meaning. Uh, Harry, wrathfully looking at the at door, I might have known no girl could keep a secret. Bishop Armstrong, hastily. It's, it's my fault. I wrung it out of her. I kicked her, I kicked her shins. I squeezed her neck. I twisted her arm. Harry, disgusted. And now you're making fun of me. Well, right? Um, so, you see different uses of and in English, one of them uh, is uh, mirative. And yields mirative inferences, or parasitic mirative, it can be called, when it does not involve the quest for an answer, as in one, um, versus when it does, as in two. For instance, if you take a look at the first couple of sentences, A says, I did everything for her, B says, and she left you. This is a mirative expression. Um, in the second one, it's a, um, I did everything for her and she left you, right? So in one, we have interaction between old and new knowledge. The utterer of the and sentence reconsiders with astonishment the fact that she or he had not originally considered as such. B already knew that A had been dropped, but now that he also knows that A act uh, always acted in a caring way, uh, he or she is surprised about his being dropped. Um, German. In German, you have a similar situation. <laughs> Friedrich, would you please read that one for me? Wir gehen nachts zu den Mädchen, gibt Felix zur Antwort. Und das noch über die Feuerleiter. 
wisst ihr eigentlich nicht, was für eine Strafe auf die unzweckmäßige Benutzung dieser Feuerleiter folgt? Ja, yeah. okay, so okay. in German, you can also have und and uh, in the beginning and it, it expresses um, um, memorativity. Uh, but not all languages show in coordination of and in order to express memorativity. For example, uh, our uh, Korean um, uh, co-author uh, Sangha um, uh, is absolutely, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, determined uh, uh, to, to, to claim that the clear and coordinator co, well, here you see the clear and coordinator because in Korean we we have we happen to have a lot of a lot of forms which are not clear either coordinators or subordinators but here this co form th this is a clear coordinator and and it does not carry the mirativity marking function um, it has other functions as uh, we will see a, a little bit later so, this was about but and and, for which you can find enough examples across languages as expressions of um, narrativity after undergoing in coordination. Um, now, when it comes to the other typical uh, coordinating connective, namely or, this is what you find in our textbooks, and, but and or are the uh, canonical coordinating connectives. Then you have the subordinators, then you have a, um, a different intermediate group of, um, of connectives which are neither clear coordinators nor clear subordinators. But the clear ones are and, but and or. What about or? It's difficult, it has been very difficult for us to come across languages where or can also uh, undergo in coordination um, and uh, express uh, uh, mirativity. Um, but we only have one uh, case uh, which comes, well, th this is the mother tongue of a, of a, a student from Syria um, uh, of mine. Um, and um, he found uh, this uh, uh, context, this example from his um, 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 own um, um, language variety, Western Neo Aramaic which is a Semitic language spoken in three villages in Syria. Um, so it is about the form willa, which can be used either as, as a disjunction or, or as a mirative marker, lo and behold, at the beginning of a clause, in a narrative only. Um, so here, this is how uh, the willa form functions as a, as a, as a conjunction. Um, I don't know whether this book belongs to Barbara or Saba, right? We have Willa mm -hmm. or... But then, in a context uh, where the speaker is narrating a story and something unexpected happens, um, the narrator is telling a story about a man, Yusuf's father, who collected firewood from the mountain. Here is what you have. Well, the English translation is, one day, as Yusuf's father went up the far mountain to bring some firewood, he heard a sound. So it is in this final part of the utterance that we have the surprise, the mirativity expressed. And how is it expressed? Um, it is expressed by, uh, here, here, here is the final part, the mirative one. Um, it is expressed by using the conjunction or. So you begin, I mean the clause, uh, with willa, here in the past, uh, third person singular sound. He heard an unexpected sound, or lo and behold, he heard a sound. But that's the only example that we have of or in, <laughs> in coordinated or expressing narrativity. Now, uh, let me step back together with you now and take a look at the bigger picture. So, what is all this about in coordination, uh, um, uh, mirativity, insubordination, uh, and as I will introduce uh, to you now today, actually for the first time, we've been exchanging emails uh, today, um, and we came up with this new term in addition to in coordination, namely in co subordination, right? <laughs> um, 
So it's just like, it's like yeah. <laughs> they need a machinery of producing terms. Um, so, so far, um, we made a connection between in coordination as a process, um, it is a morphosyntactic process actually, which um, leads, which can lead, lead, among other things, to the expression of mirativity, right? Uh, but we have to point out that while in coordination may result in mirativity denoting structures, we are not claiming that in coordination is the only mechanism leading to such structures, right? Um, Evans uh, shows that insubordination is what often underlies the rise of surprise denoting utterances. If you, if you remember in an earlier slide, I also gave you the same examples uh, where we have why uh, expression in the beginning of an exclamative or two um, in the beginning of an exclamative and also that. Um, now, the other thing that we have to, uh, to bear in mind is that in coordination may result in structures which do not have to express mirativity. So we can have also other um, um, functions, other meanings uh, which result from the process of incoordination. Namely, incoordination can lead to the use of a sentence particle which is a comment marker, for instance. Um, here is an example from English and used as a sentence particle, as a comment marker. Then she says, your daddy and me used to drive his old road on his bike. You did lots you don't know, Mama says. And she's right about that. She's right about that. Right? Um, Bill, and this is so typical, was dating several women at the same time. Um, so, uh, you see, here we see and uh, used as a comment marker. And again, we have in coordination. Um, in coordination can lead to an expression, to a sentence particle, which marks shift in topic, not only comment. For instance, mirativity, well, in one of my earlier slides, uh, we had the following thing. Mirativity is not the same as evidentiality. And then I said, mm -hmm. But what does evidentiality mean? Uh, here I obviously use but. <laughs> I, I did my in coordination and I use but as a, a shifting topic marker. English, um, in English and, uh, can also have uh, use as a sentence particle, can also function as a shifting topic marker. I'm quite happy with my new job. This is what A says, but B says, and where are you going on holiday? Again and uses a sentence particle for a shift in topic. Um, now, some languages manifest in coordination of more than one coordinated conjunctions at the same time. Persian is one such language, and here both and and but may undergo in coordination within the same structure in order to indicate shift of topic. For instance, um, if you want to say, and now, the weather report on TV, you know, shift of, top of topic, um, in topic, uh, what you do in Persian is uh, you use first uh, and and then but, you, you can recognize ama, <laughs> but ama, uh, and then report the SFA construction, state um, SFA, and then weather. And what you're saying is in English, and now the weather report. Um, so until now, uh, our tacit assumption here, you know, talking about incoordination versus <coughs> insubordination, the tacit assumption obviously was that uh, think, I mean, syntax can be orderly, neatly divided into subordination and coordination. This, however, as we know, is not the the, the a realistic picture of what we find in languages. There does exist, in fact, syntactic gradients, and uh, you know you have indications of this already in the uh, in works from uh, 1932, uh, and then more recently also 1981, Van etc., etc. So basically, um, when it comes to coordination, we say that we have 
two clauses combined in within a complex uh, um, uh, sentence where both clauses are not dependent and they are not embedded. Stew likes potatoes but John likes tomatoes. When it comes to subordination, uh, we have two clauses, both of which are dependent and both of which are embedded. Uh, but now there is also this middle ground, those situations which are neither subordination or, in co or um, um, coordination. And the term that has been um, um, suggested for this uh, is co-subordination. Here is an example um, from um, um, Colette uh, Craig. Um, it, I'll just uh, take a look at the uh, English uh, translation of the example. Um, you have, I wash the clothes, whistling. Now this whistling is a very interesting uh, 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 form because uh, it is actually one clause, all right? And you see it is a dependent uh, predicate uh, because it cannot be used on its own. On the other hand, it is not embedded, right? It is, it is separate from uh, the, the, the main clause, I wash the clothes. And if, if you take a look at the, the structure in Yakotek, you really, you, you have, uh, you know, the subject and then, uh, and then the, the verb and that's your um, dependent uh, clause and the other one is absolutely normally marked uh, as a finite uh, verb clause um, in the main clause. Now, uh, cost subordination is this middle ground uh, and cost subordination crucially involves the so-called dependent predicates. And dependent predicates are verbs which cannot be used in independent clauses, as I said. Mauri Simone, um, who did um, his PhD 2015 and then later on can continued on uh, this variety of Berber spoken in Morocco, um, uh, he, I mean, his latest uh, article in Studies in Language is the most insightful study of what can be regarded as a particular kind of co-subordination, so the middle ground, he exemplifies it uh, by means of um, the so-called chained heiress construction. Um, and in the chain, chain heiress construction, there is an example. Uh, the English translation would be, he went to the market and came back. So you see here, the first clause is marked very nicely, fully, by a tense aspect mood um, uh, um, uh, form. Uh, th this is the perfective uh, form here. Uh, but the second clause, um, which is not embedded, uh, it is an aorist in the venative. Uh, but the aorist is a non-marked form for tense aspect and mood, right? Um, and uh, it is a dependent predicate. On the other hand, it is not embedded. So the two clauses are juxtaposed without the use of any conjunction, and the aorist verb is interpreted as having perfective value as it follows an initial perfective form. So we have a situation of a plus dependent minus embedded um, uh, 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 clause, and this is uh, a clear example of co-subordination. Then the question is, the question that I asked Mauri was, is it possible to omit the initial clause in the initial medial mm -hmm. clause chaining construction, that is the his construction, the, the chained areas construction, this, this example of co-subordination, you know, the middle ground uh, situation. And um, Maori uh, answered, uh, not Maori, Simone. <laughs> Simone answered, well, the topic needs more study, he said, but it seems to be the case that this is possible. And uh, actually, I'm quoting um, his email. I recall a situation in the field when one of my language assistants uttered a dependent predicate. Dependent predicate is the, the mm -hmm. in, uh, sorry, is the co-subordinated clause. Mm -hmm. When a dependent predicate, after resuming his narration, after a long interruption. The dependent predicate was the first verb uttered after the long break. That was meant to flag his attention, to link the conversation back to where the interruption had taken place. And indeed, also in his thesis uh, back in 2015, um, uh, Simone pointed out that the function, the major function of the, this chained 
Aries construction, the co-subordination type um, in um, um, Ayat Atta Tamazic is cohesion, which is a very interesting finding. So, in that case, and he also, um, I mean, he also has another article uh, where it becomes clear that <coughs> in Mundu, uh, a medial form uh, may be used without any initial form in narrative discourse. Uh, so then we can speak of in co sorry, in co subordination, most likely. As Simone says, <laughs> further research is needed, but things look like this is going to be the case. My final slide. What did we do here? We built a case for the morphosyntactic phenomenon of incoordination as a mirror of insubordination. We showed that incoordination may, may lead to yet another mirror strategy that has remained unnoticed in the literature so far across languages. And we propose that what Nicholas Emmons discovered about the independent use of subordinated clauses in his uh, 2007 study may well turn out to hold true for all areas of sentence formation. That is, the process of undoing syntax in discourse pragmatic situations may be detected not only in coordination, subordination, but also in the grey or fuzzy zone of co-subordination. And I really abused your patience here, <laughs> for which I apologise. Thank you very much.